Hello and welcome. My name is Alan Nelson. I'm the founder and CEO of Accounting CPD. Thank you for joining us for this final Lunch and Learn session of 2023. I should start by welcoming all of you attending. I hope you find the next hour interesting, relevant and useful. This month, I'm joined by three guests. First up is Julia Penny, who will be talking about her year as president of ICAW. Then I'm welcoming Steve Collins, who will be talking about the main updates we should be aware of in the last 12 months, and in particular, the FRC's periodic review. And finally, I'll be talking to Accounting CPD's Rachel Bruce, who will be sharing some thoughts, some insights we've gleaned from you over the past month. As we go along, please do ask questions. The Q&A session at the end is often the most interesting part of the webinar, but it only works if you ask those questions. Along the way, you can also contribute by using the chat facility, and I'll try to pick those questions up as we go. So, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our first guest, Julia Penny. Julia is the immediate past president of ICAW, having been a non-executive ICAW board member since 2017 and chair of the board during her year as president. Julia is also a member of ICAW Council and a past chair of both the ICAW Technical Advisory and Ethics Advisory Committees, a former member of the Technical Strategy and Financial Reporting Faculty Boards and of the IAT's Council and Audit Committee. Committee. Outside of this volunteer ICAW involvement, Julia is also a well-known speaker and writer on audit, financial reporting, anti-money laundering and wider issues impacting the profession. She's passionate about audit quality and a well-functioning profession. This includes a sharp focus on improving diversity, developing the use of technology, and constantly reflecting on the need for businesses to become sustainable and how the professionals can help achieve this. Hello, Julia. Hello, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you're very welcome. Um, we're here to talk about your experiences uh, over the last year, and it's a real um, privilege to be able to, uh, to, to be able to, to do this in this setting with a bit of time to spend on it. So perhaps I should, before we go into kind of what your personal experience was, perhaps I can ask you to start by telling us what, what people may think is obvious, but what, what is what does the role of being the president actually involve? Well, it's interesting because it's actually changed between my year as president and now. So during my year as president, there, there were two elements, two key elements to it. And one, as you said, was chairing the board, the ICAW board, which works sort of pretty much like a corporate board. The other side of it was what I might broadly call the ambassadorial side, meeting members, prospective members, students, other stakeholders, and you know, really getting the message out there and hearing the views in there as to what ICAW wanted to talk about and what members and others wanted to talk to us about. Now, that role has now changed because uh, we've done a uh, governance review. We're still in the process of some of the governance review at ICAW. And what we decided was that having a chair of the board for just one year, which is what you get with the president, because you're only president for one year, is a bit disruptive to change every year. So the tail end of my responsibility as president was chairing the panel that recruited a new chair of the board externally, you know, a paid chair, who will have the role like a normal corporate um, um chair of the board role, three-year terms, renewable twice, so that you get a maximum of nine years. So you get a continuity, at least three years, maybe up to nine years of having that chair. So the current president will still have all of that ambassadorial role. Very, very important to do that listening, to do that talking to members and others that we want to engage with. Um, but the chair of the board role now sits with uh, Peter Wyman, is, is our chair of the board. Right, that sounds like a very sensible. I know it's an issue for all um, professional membership bodies. I think the kind of uh, uh, not only that, but the tension between uh, uh, can, does the executive get too powerful and, and do the members become you know trying to get all that right is constantly difficult. I think, and I've seen organisations who seem to have it absolutely perfectly nailed, but they're relatively rare. Um, yeah, yes, I think definitely rare. <laughs> So, so you talked about the ambassadorial role and about some of the mm. things ICAW was trying to, to get across and some of the things you were listening to from members. To, to what extent were you able to make progress or make some gains that, that in, uh, in areas that you cared about? Um, some progress. I mean, I think all of these things, they're a bit of a team effort and they take more than a single year, which is why we've made some of the governance changes. But I think... Um, a lot of the conversations I had, particularly with firms of accountants rather than those in business, firms were very much interested in 
you know, the trust in the profession, the attractiveness of the profession, and the difficulties that firms were starting to see in people thinking audit, especially, was not looking so good. And it didn't matter which country I was in, there were very similar concerns that the regulators were getting over aggressive. And of course, you know, everybody gets a little bit vulnerable when you've got a regulator saying you need to be better, you need to be better. But there is in real life, there's a balance between how much you want the regulator to pound you on the head um, and you still want to have an attractive profession. And of course, if the regulator goes overboard with the pounding on your head, uh, metaphorically, obviously, um, then people say, well, you know, why would I want to audit? I, I just won't do it. And then you have another problem, which is there aren't enough auditors or there aren't good enough quality auditors and the regulator still doesn't achieve what they're wanting to achieve. So I think there were lots of conversations with the regulators as well as with firms around trying to get that balance right and trying to get across the, you know, to the regulators that if you go too hard on something, actually law of unintended consequences, you make audit very unattractive, then you don't actually have any auditors or you don't have good auditors or you don't have enough. Um, and the other side, firms understanding that obviously you've got to get that quality you've got to work as a firm um, and we've got a new quality management standard which I'm sure has been talked about over the past year ISQM one and two but you know one being the primary overall one where firms are embedding that starting to work with it starting to try and get that quality approach based on risks you know what might go wrong with my quality how do I mitigate that And it's all part of that big ecosystem of regulators, firms, individual auditors. How do you bring it all together? So there were lots of conversations there. And I think, you know, started to, um, as you say, sort of move the dial, but still a lot of work to be done on that. So that was that was one area um, which, yeah, lots going on in in that area. There were others, too, but I'll pause for a moment. (laughs) Well, I, I, you don't really know. I'm, I, I'm going to try and avoid talking to Steve about this later as well. We've just finished our audit and filed their accounts this week. And it was a painful process, which involved me arguing with them a lot. And, and I, it's changed my opinion. But, but one thing that was really clear to me was that although I was moaning about the quality of the work that was going on, they were clearly suffering from a difficulty of retaining and hiring staff. And, and the, 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 apart from the audit manager, the entire team who ran the audit were, were new from last year. So all the work we've done, yeah. you know, forget with them getting to know the business and understanding things, that was all lost. I, don't, I mean, you do still, obviously, yeah. you still have the audit files and you, you've got the information, but it's not the same as the same people. It's, it's not the same as, as what's in your, in your head. We're, we're not just computers. We're not just what we write down. You have to write it down, but as you say, it, it, it's not the same. And I think that a, that, that problem with staff has been uh, a big problem, again, in lots of jurisdictions I have was lucky enough to go to you know lots of different places over my year as president and virtually everybody India being the exception um were saying that you know there aren't enough staff there aren't enough accountants but in particular there aren't enough auditors and we had a big merry-go-round I think after the pandemic when people started thinking oh well I don't know is this what I want to do and there was a big merry-go-round of staff moving on to other things Interestingly, we've now, you know, the economic environment has changed. We've, we've seen in the last uh, sort of few months conversations with firms and in, in the newspapers, we've seen that uh, redundancies are sort of on the cards. Probably not in audit, it has to be said. But nonetheless, we, we may begin to get a shift because if you start making redundancies and other bits, a lot of accountants um, might still have auditing skills. They might only have recently left audit and they might think, well, actually, audit carries on when other bits of the business like the management consultancy sort of stop so maybe we'll get a bit of a rebalancing but I think you know it's a longer term thing as students in particular come out of universities at the moment they're thinking that they want uh dare I say it sexy tech sector jobs you know the bright young things are looking to different areas and one of the important things that I was talking about in my year as president is Actually, accountancy gives you a huge opportunity. You can do sustainability, assurance or reporting. Uh, you can specialise in you know, making sure that financial markets work properly by being involved in audit, either internally or externally. You can help make sure businesses run properly. There's a lot of tech involved in accountancy now. So by going into accountancy, you're not saying, oh, I don't want to do tech. You're saying, I want to do tech in a particular area. Um, you know, so... Getting across that, 
and the increasing and there's a, more work to be done on this but you know the increasing diversity the inclusion part of the accountancy profession this is really important we're starting on the journey rather than finishing it but I think those were conversations which were very important continue to be very important making sure that people understand how attractive the accountancy profession is and I'm probably speaking to the converted given that um, everybody here is probably an accountant but you know when you're talking to the next generation up you know there are lots of different opportunities coming in um, to accountancy and of course you can come in at a later point in your life as well you don't have to come in straight from being a student and that's always been the case so I think you know those were really interesting very important conversations that I was having as president with members with firms um, with those in business as well. You mentioned along the way there um, the subject of diversity, which I know is something that you, you care about. Um, I also, I looked up how many ICAW presidents there have been. You, you can't actually look that up. You have to count. And I, I got, apart from a period, it doesn't really look like one every year, with, with, except for the, during the Second World War. But So that stretches back of maybe 150 years. You're, you were only the fourth female um, president. Um, yeah. Do you think enough progress is being made in that area? Um, are, we, are we moving forward quickly enough? Um, I, I suppose my gut, my gut answer is no, uh, and that's partly why I stood as uh, you have to get elected as president. So council, which is a body of around about hundred uh, people, um, elect you as vice president. You do a year as vice president, year of deputy president, year of president, as long as nothing goes horribly wrong along the way. And as you say, yeah, the fourth, uh, we will have a hundred fiftieth anniversary in in. 2030 so the, the fourth in sort of 142 or 143 if you count the end of the year depending where you're going and you think mm, gosh it's not really what we're looking for on the plus side um three of those four have been since uh 2016 so you know it's much much better than it was we um i'm hoping that in another few years uh we will have another female president in another few years but we've got three men next on the roster um so you know it's better than it was i uh, i think there's more work to be done and there's more work to be done and from the governance point of view there's a lot of work you know as part of the governance review looking at how you get the diversity inclusion how you make sure that it's a place where where women as well as men but but not just the gender diversity you know all other aspects of diversity as well so ethnicity uh, disabilities and so on and so forth that it's a place which is comfortable for everybody where everybody think so oh, yeah I can put my hand up I could you know I could get voted for um it, it, you know it's a journey <laughs> we're not there yet uh we're not necessarily and I think this probably a, applies to most accountancy bodies we're not necessarily the quickest at changing things um we tend to be as accountants quite conservative in nature so change is not necessarily rapid but the more people stand up and say I'm going to challenge the status quo the quicker we get that change. And so that's, you know, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about over my year or was talking a lot over my year as president. Right. Um, that, that I, I think uh, from sitting slightly outside of the profession, but very close to it, it feels to me as though it, you know, it's not rapid, but progress is definitely being made. Um, and I'm sure there are some perspectives where it's being made more quickly um, than others. Um, we've done a, a fair bit of work in that area over the last um, over the last few months. Uh, in fact, the webinar we're doing on Thursday focuses on inclusivity and diversity. So anybody is interested, that's available. Um, should be worth seeing. Um, uh, can I ask you? I mean, feel free to say no to this. Um, not not no not no. You can't ask me. I'm going to ask you. But <laughs> no, I didn't. But were there things that ICAW, I, I'm always curious about somebody who takes up this role. Are there things that the, the Institute wants you to, to talk about or lines that they want you to, to put forward that you're less comfortable with or less enthusiastic about? Um, I mean, if you took it on a scale, there would, there would probably be things that, yeah, I'm, I'm just less passionate about rather than less comfortable. So I don't think, I mean, to, to some extent, because I've been so heavily involved with the Institute for quite a lot of years, I'm quite closely aligned. You know, they've, they've got a strategy. So they've got sort of three core pillars of the strategy, which is about members and students, which is about reputation um, and uh, you know, which is about the regulatory side of it. So there, yeah, there's nothing to be sort of upset about, if you like, or, or not want in those areas. And then we've got five strategic themes. And those strategic themes are you know, strengthening trust, 
in ICAW chartered accountants and the profession more widely, um, particularly, you know, post Carillion and whatever, that, that's really important. So that links in very closely with my audit quality um, work that I do in my sort of day job, if you like, and that I think is so important. So that's, you know, that's fine. I feel very closely identified with that. And the next one is achieving or helping to achieve the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And obviously the sustainability part is, is a bit of that. Uh, you can't do everything. There's there's loads of SDGs, what is it, 17 or something goals. Um, but there are a number, including some of the equality and the diversity points, which, which come into that, as well as the environment, um, which are very important. And transforming trade and economy, I can't talk very much about that. I think it's more about tax. It's more about how government works. But you know, there's nothing in it that I object to. And then we've got um, tech and data and mastering tech and data. And that's so important that accountants can do the tech and data because otherwise somebody else will take our jobs entirely, if you like. And then you've got the attracting talent, building diversity because that will strengthen the profession. So all of those strategic themes I was very on board with. There wasn't anything which I thought, oh, no, you know, I, I don't want to say that because I you know, would never ethically say something that I didn't believe in. But nonetheless, would I push one bit more than another bit Oh, yes. And I definitely, you know, was pushing hard on the diversity side um, and, and trying to push hard on the, the sustainability side and the importance of accountants taking a proactive role in that. It, it, that's all. I mean, I, I, I'm admirable, I think, and I completely agree. But actually, interestingly, you were there at a time with the particularly the audit profession under under, uh, you know, barrage of criticism where um, the, the obvious lines the industry would take are things that as an accountant you feel you feel strongly about. Because if, if if the reputation of the profession suffers, then that that has a negative impact on everybody in the practices. It, it it does, and I think that you know that piece for me the you know the bits I don't agree with everything that everybody says in the institute or anywhere else because you know life would be very boring. And if um, any of your readers have read some of the articles that um, I I publish every now and then on various places, they. You know, I, d I don't always take the, oh, yeah, everything's fine, isn't it? Um, but it's normally about pushing a particular area and, and challenging a particular area more. And I think that sort of trust in the profession, we as accountants, we as ICAW, we as ACCA, you know, whatever professional body you're a part of, you know, you have to look at, does my institute, does my association, does it need to be doing more to help, you know, build trust in the profession? Because my job depends on people trusting me as a trusted professional. So, you know, is enough happening? And I think there was a lot of, you know, soul searching going on and, you know, things like changes to CPD requirements, which all of the ICAW members, I hope at least, will have heard um, because they're, you know, they're really major. But, you know, to, to a, a large extent, those are a response to when the outside world looks at us as auditors in particular, but as accountants, as directors in companies, uh, as people advising on finance can they be sure that they've got somebody who's fully trained, who's up to date, who's, you know, at the top of their game? And some of that CPD you know, requirement is therefore to make sure that the outside world can have more trust in that area. So I think you know, some things get pushed more than others from you know, my point of view in, in terms of where I'm interested. Yeah, I think the outside perspective, the sort of the person in the street type perspective on accountants is unfortunately lacking in terms of um, um, how professional and how ethical accountants are. I, think, I mean, I don't want to sound po faced about it, but but there's a big emphasis on ethics. And when I talk to accountants, they they really do live and breathe that stuff, most of them. But of course, you only need a couple of really bad stories where people behave badly yeah. and the whole profession gets tired. Yeah, you only need a couple. And also the other thing, um, and this is very interesting, and it links into that ISQM one sort of auditing standard, but it applies really more broadly, which is um, ISQM one takes what is called a a sort of risk approach to quality and, and it's management of that risk and it's saying okay well what might impact on the quality of whatever work I do as, a, as an accountant for instance and what you've got in that is a way to, to really reflect on the system as a whole so if I'm working in a firm what is it that makes a particular accountant in a firm you know some of the things that we've heard coming out of Carillion for instance what is it that makes a particular individual think oh, it doesn't matter if 
I don't do this or I do it wrong or I do this instead. You know, wh- why is that individual in a position that they feel either able to do that, encouraged to do that, you know, empowered, um, forced into a corner? It, so it's all part of the bigger system. And if you get a really good quality management approach, which some other industries are you know, more experienced, if you like, at taking that particular approach, they're looking all of the time at what pressures are put on the individual and is it the pressures on the individual that cause them to behave poorly or is it that the individual is just a bad apple and they just don't care or they're just not educated enough or you know so it's that wider issue and I think that's a fascinating part of the whole quality and it's not just audit even though the standard is only audit and assurance related it's you know for all of us how we do our work what risks us doing something wrong and often you know it's pressures it's interesting, isn't it, that a lot of the work you do on an audit is, is to, to make sure the right controls are in place, the right checks and balances. And a lot of those are designed to not only to deter somebody from doing something, encourage them to behave well, but also to put a second person on certain things so that two people would have to collude and do something badly rather than yeah. rather than just one. And and so, you know, it's actually a bit of a physician heal themselves in terms of uh, yeah. uh, some of the checks and balances that need to go in place in that in that audit management, uh, quality management. So, so, Absolutely. So. Um, so, um, Mark Reese has now taken over from you, and, uh, and Malcolm Backus is, is waiting in the wings uh, to take over from him. What advice would you give them? Gosh, what advice would I give? Um, well, if I'm honest, I, I, I gave Mark my to-do list, which the things that I hadn't <laughs> quite finished. the stuff I didn't get to. <laughs> Don't tell anybody else. <laughs> um, so, yeah, because you know, you're only there for a year, there were things that I like, oh, well, I'd still like these things to be done. So I did give him a little... Okay, a medium to do list, um, but I, I, I think you know the the advice is that a you've got to throw yourself into it, which both of those you know absolutely will throw themselves into it. Uh, b all of it is about relationships, about talking to people, it's about hearing those views, it's about feeding those back and continuing to sort of develop you know what the ICW is doing to make sure that. We're dealing with concerns where concerns arise to make sure that we're driving um, things externally, for instance, with regulators, uh, with others. And of course, it'll be a bit different for for Mark because he he chaired for a short while because we didn't have Peter Wyman in place quite straight away. Um, But then he's doing the ambassadorial stuff. He's sitting on the board still. So it's still really important that he got that voice of being able to say okay look members are saying or others that I'm talking to are saying but I think it's about throwing themselves into it it's about listening hard and it's about making sure that they you know also push where there are things that yeah yeah no this needs doing this needs doing this needs doing that you know they are tenacious um and they push things forward and I know both of them very well and they are both extremely tenacious so I'm very confident that that we've left it all in good hands. That's great. I think if I can get that listening piece right, that's really important. I, I really sympathise with the fact that you're every time you're sent to a, to an event, you're expected to make a speech, and um, yeah. so you're not in listening mode automatically. You must have to make yourself do that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you're, you're very concentrated. You prepare. You've got your speech. You're like, okay, I'm going to talk about this. But then, as you say, you, you need to listen back, and the listening is usually in the less formal things. So I have to say, I mean, I was lucky enough to have quite a lot of breakfasts, lunches, dinners. Um, <laughs> Drinks, receptions, and goodness what, and and those are opportunities to to listen and then make sure that you feed back those those points so that they you know that they don't get get lost because ultimately you know it is a professional body. Professional body is made up of members and prospective members you know coming in. We've got to make sure that that we understand what they think, and that's one of the key roles that the president has to meet tons of members and to say, okay, right, this is what I'm hearing. Yeah, there must be things that they'd be prepared to say to you that they wouldn't quite say to just a member of the executive team. I, I think so, because you're talking to them member to member, even though lots of the executive team are also members, um, almost all of them, actually. But it's different, isn't it? The dynamic is is different. So they will, dare I say, they'll moan at you. <laughs> they'll moan with you. They'll... <laughs> Um, you know, express, oh, oh, I want this to happen, I want that to happen. And some of it is realistic and some of it isn't realistic. And, you know, sometimes you you can't just promise and say, oh, yeah, yeah, all of that will be done because, you know, what one person wants might be diametrically opposed to what somebody else wants. You know, so some people will tell you, oh, sustainability, that's a load of rubbish. It's 
yeah, you know, world's gone mad. And you're like, well, you know, that's all very well, but what about, you know, your assets for the company that you work in, you you run? They might change in value because actually, you know, there's a flood, there's a forest fire, there's um, all sorts of other things. That, you know, we've started to see some of the climate change impacts um, mucking up the weather. And it does have, you know, direct physically and physical impacts on assets. But then you've got the non-physical ones where people stop buying, I don't know, like they stop buying individual single-use bottles of water because, oh, well, actually, that's not a very good idea, is it? I'll bring my own bottle. I'll refill it. If you were the company producing bottles, you've got to have found something else to do. Otherwise, you've gone bust or you're about to. Yeah, there's lots of frictional frictional um, difficulties for organisations like that. I have, yeah. I have one more question for you before you go. We need to be brief. But uh, uh, the question is, what are you going to do with all the time you've got there? Um, yeah, it seems to get swallowed up quite quickly. I, I'm, I went freelance a couple of years before. Uh, so in 2020, pandemic, not really a very helpful start to going freelance. And so now I'm basically trying to build up my, my work again. But I'm also looking, I think, for a non-executive directorship. Having sat on the board since 2017, as you said, sat on a nominating committee, recruited in chair of the, a new chair of the board, uh, Remco, audit committee experience in various places. I sort of think, oh, yes, I think I'm missing that a little bit. So looking for that, but um, all the technical and training. So, uh, yeah. I'm writing slides on ISA 600 at the moment for something else. And so it, it's getting that work up and going again. And, oh, yeah, a little bit of golf in there as well. <laughs> Good for you. I'm glad to hear it. OK, so I'm going to have to bring that section of the, of the webinar to a close or we'll run out of time. So for now, I'll say thank you very much, Julia. Uh, we'll see you in a few minutes and we welcome everybody, welcome you back to answer questions from people. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'll hang around. So without further ado, I should introduce our next guest, Steve Collins. Steve is the audit and technical partner at Levitt Wormsley Associates. He's a prolific writer and commentator on all aspects of financial reporting and audit and the author of over 20 books on the subject. A good friend of accounting CPD, Steve is a frequent guest at these webinars, author of CPD Bytes and News Bytes and of several of our courses, including, of course, our annual updates on New Can Island Gap and on Ormsley. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. So we're here today to look at the year of 2023. Um, yeah. You were with us a couple of months ago and we focused on auditing updates. And so I, today I thought perhaps we should focus on financial reporting. Uh, the big event of the year was the FRC's periodic review. What are the main changes there that people should be aware of? Well, I mean, the periodic review, it's its its sort of still ongoing at the moment. Um, the, 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 the FRC are, are sort of busy beavering away, I think, behind the scenes, um, finalising the amendments um, to the periodic review. Um, there, there, there are some headline proposals on the cards from the FRC. Um, and what I can sort of say is, is, is having quite a lot of conversations with the FRC in various different roles that I have with professional bodies and in other sort of arenas. Um, I am lucky to get sort of updates on a periodic basis from them. And the last update um, that we got, um, they have confirmed that the effective date of the amendments has been pushed back further, which I sort of expected um, to happen because the this, the standard setting process is, it's, it's, it's quite a, a very long-winded process, even to make sort of... Um, a small change to an accounting standard or a section of the accounting standard involves an awful lot of work behind the scenes by the FRC in looking at the change, looking at sort of uh, any fatal flaws, going through various committees, all the way through to being approved by the FRC board. So you can imagine that on a periodic review with an exposure draft that's about 340 odd pages long, that there's an awful lot of work needs doing behind the scenes. Um, so the FRC have sort of confirmed that the periodic review amendments will become effective for accounting periods commencing on after the 1st of January 2026. We are expecting early adoption to be permissible. I'm also expecting the FRC to say that if you want to early adopt uh, an amendment, you will need to early adopt all the amendments at the same time. 
Now, a lot of people who I've certainly been speaking to in courses over the last few months have sort of said, well, that's ages off, isn't it? First of January 2026. But when you consider the impacts of some of the amendments that are proposed, and they are quite significant in terms of the, the not only the accounting treatment, but also the impact that the changes could have on businesses. And I think the first, the headline changes, of course, um, on balance sheet lease accounting. And this is very likely to um, go ahead. I mean, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, um, but if I was, I would put money on this finding its way into FRS 102. Um, and the FRC have said that this is very much the direction of travel that they're going in um, with on balance sheet lease accounting. Now, this it's important just to understand that there are sort of two mainstream standards in the UK and Republic of Ireland. You've got FRS 102, which I would say is the most common. Everybody's heard of FRS 102, I would hope, anyway, if you're preparing financial statements. And then you've got FRS 105, which is the micro entity standard. Um, the on balance sheet, <laughs> excuse me, lease accounting rules won't find their way into FRS 105. So FRS 105 is being left alone where that's concerned. But essentially, um, pretty much every sort of lease will find its way on the balance sheet. And a lot of accountants get sort of um, confused by what is going on here, because, you know, a lot of questions that I get asked involve the one, well, why will one asset be on two balance sheets? It's going to be on the lessor's balance sheet and the lessee's balance sheet. And technically, that's not quite right, because... The lessee isn't capitalising the asset as such. They're capitalising their right to use that asset. And that's sort of the approach that Section 20 will be taking. So we are going to sort of see a lot um, of change where on balance sheet lease accounting is concerned. Those changes will, of course, be reflected in the Nelson, uh, the accounting CPD course that I write for the UK GAP update um, to, to make sure that, you know, delegates are aware of the changes. I think the important aspect for accountants where that is concerned is to a not only understand the technical changes. I mean, the reality of it is, is most accountants know how to account for a finance lease. And basically, that's what we'll be doing most of is accounting for finance lease, even though you won't have a distinction between a finance and an operating lease anymore. But also, I think the important thing is for businesses to be looking at things like any potential loan covenants that they've got in place, because, of course, the on balance sheet lease approach will mean that you're going to be bringing on additional assets and liabilities onto the balance sheet. There's a risk that um, existing debt covenants could get breached. Now, some financiers might take the view that, well, if it's a breach of a debt covenant because of uh, a change in regulation, so, for example, the FRC have made a change to an accounting standard and therefore the client can't help it, they've got to do it, then some financiers may be more willing to negotiate debt covenants or even sort of say, well, it, you know, that's outside the scope of a breach, if you like. But it is always worth looking at agreements and sort of determining whether there are any breaches that could happen, because getting prepared right from the outset of all of this is something is one of the reasons really why the FRC are giving such a long implementation period so that there's a lot of people that can get prepared for this, including software providers as well. So I think on balance sheet lease accounting, that is one of the key points to be aware of. Um, the other sort of headline um, change, which I don't feel, it's not that I don't feel strongly, you know, it's 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 just I'm, I'm sort of less concerned about the revenue recognition changes than I am the lease accounting changes. And revenue recognition, we're having brand new Section 23 in FRS 102 and brand new Section 18 in FRS 105. And essentially, uh, to sum the change up, what the FRC are doing is is um, aligning the revenue recognition rules to that of IFRS 15, although it's wrong to say it's going to be IFRS 15 because you can't have IFRS um, in full in FRS 102 because that would be completely disproportionate. Um, 
I'm less concerned about that because, I mean, we already have a sort of um, step model approach in Section 23, for example. So we've got like five criteria that have to be met before we recognise a sale of goods. And we've got four criteria that are met to determine the reliability of the outcome of a contract sort of thing. So we're already used to this going through various stages to make sure that something's happened before we recognise a sale. So the five-step model approach, I think, is going to be, um, it will sort of change some revenue practices, but I would be amazed, I've said this quite publicly, I'd be amazed if we are going to see wholesale um, restatements of revenue and ways of changes in accounting policies. I think, I think what it will do is force companies to review their revenue accounting policy, um, not only just to make sure that they are doing things in accordance with their declared policies, but also making sure that perhaps the disclosure note in the accounting policy section of the accounts is up to date, is appropriate, and is, of course, entity specific. So there's quite a few changes on the cards where the periodic review is concerned. And I know the 1st of January 2026 may seem quite a long way off, but I was talking to my co-director this week and we were amazed just how quickly five years has gone past. Um, you know, it just, the, the years just seem to get... They, they just zoom past quicker and quicker. You're getting older, Steve. This is it. Well, yeah, I'm trying to avoid, I'm trying to avoid uh, saying, well, yeah, I am in the final year of my 40s now. So it's sort of like, you know, it's true what your grandparents say. When As you get older, it goes quicker. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I think that's where we are with the periodic review. So the FRC have sort of said that they will be issuing the final amendments in the first half of 2024. Um, that, of course, takes us up to the end of June. But, uh, you know, I, I, I would imagine that the FRC uh, will get them out before before those uh, sorts of dates. But as I say, there's there's a there's a huge process that goes on behind the scenes. I was involved in the standard setting process for about five years, a couple of years ago. So there's a huge process that goes on behind the scenes. So it isn't easy for them to just you know, update the documents and send it, send all the publications out. But I think the key points to be aware of, if you are involved in preparation of UK and Ireland GAP financial statements, is just to keep an eye out on developments and keep clients informed sooner rather than later, because there are a number of clients that are going to be significantly affected by this. I've got a client at the moment that's in the haulage industry, and they've got about 75 operating leases that are all going to have to go on the balance sheet under the new rules. Um, and we've already we've already started doing the impact assessment on, on all of this as well. So it is something that we do need to keep an awareness of. The, the, uh, one of the things that I know has been highlighted by people as, as with both the leases and the revenue recognition, um, as, as things that have seemed to be, have, have been introduced into FRS, into IFRS, coming down to FRS 102. I'm not sure coming down is the right phrase, actually. That suggests that one's superior to the other, doesn't it? Um, that there's an issue of kind of pro uh, 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 the burden on really on, on the smaller businesses of doing some of these things. And certainly, without going into uh, the, the, lots of detail, the the debates I was having with the auditors were about revenue recognition. We we, we, we make about 50,000 sales a year each time someone buys a combination of different products with different access periods. And if you take a very, very... Um, a purist line to the way that that revenue is spread out, you could end up more people counting up the money than, than actually going into providing the service. And so there was a whole that ongoing long debate about what was reasonable and, and what, what, how close we had to get to the you know, absolute letter of the law. Are there other ways in which the, the, the changes that are being proposed in the periodic review might have a disproportionate impact on the SME? Yeah, that, that you've made a very, very valid point there because I think... One of the issues that's come out of the um, exposure, there was a four month comment period for the uh, for Fred 82, which was the exposure draft of the changes that the FRC are proposing, which is slightly longer than standard. Usually an exposure draft is about three months, but given the nature of these changes, the FRC deemed it necessary to have that uh, have a little bit longer. 
And um, interestingly, some of the comments, they received, I think, about 54 comment letters, the FRC, on FRED82, which I thought was quite a low response rate, really, for something that contains some pretty significant changes. Uh, But some commentators have suggested that the revenue recognition rules that they are proposing are too onerous for micro entities and FRS 105 should be left as it is for micro entities. And this has sort of left the team involved in dealing with the periodic review, scratching their heads to a certain extent as to what they can do to try and alleviate those concerns. Because obviously micro entities need a very, very um, straightforward and simple accounting standard to reflect the complexity and the nature of their businesses. So there's sort of... um, There are some concerns already been raised about things like that. The on-balance sheet lease accounting issue, that is also, um, that's also been sort of um, mixed in terms of the the responses. And and what I've found, particularly in courses over the last six months, is that it's a very divisive subject, this on-balance sheet lease accounting. You've got those that are completely against it, and you've got those that are completely for it, and there's nobody sat on the fence in the middle. Um, and there are some sort of comments that have been sent into the FRC um about what they're proposing and even though it is very likely that we are going to be doing on balance sheet lease accounting the frc are looking at clarifying what they're proposing to do so for example i've got a bit of an issue with the frc's proposal to um about the low value assets thing so if you've got a, a an ass, a lease of an asset that's of low value you can pretty much treat it the same way that you would treat a current operating lease and I, I think there's a danger of this being misinterpreted so i've said to the frc why don't you just quantify something now if you look at ifrs 16 in the basis for conclusions the iasb rightfully or wrong rightly or wrongly did have uh, put in their sort of basis for conclusions that they had an amount of 5,000 US dollars in mind when they were developing IFRS 16. So it's important to emphasize this, that figure is not in the standard, it's in the basis for conclusions. Um, And I've asked the FRC if they would consider quantifying it. And basically, it's a no, it's going to be a no. But what they are going to do is they are going to look at making it clearer as to what things like low value means in the standard and perhaps looking at FRS 105 to sort of come up with a solution that's proportionate to to micro entities. And the, the, this is where the FRC need comments and um, feedback on exposure drafts, because if they don't know, um, the FRC aren't going to be able to do anything about it. So if, if the likes of myself and Julia go on, uh, going to do a lecture and we are explaining what the technical changes are and delegates aren't happy and they say well we don't agree with it we think it should be this or we think it should be that and my immediate question to them then is well did you write in to the frc and explain that when you were when you had the opportunity and the answer is usually no and this is why i always sort of say whenever you've got something in an exposure draft that you do feel quite strongly about then it is always worth submitting a response to the frc i think that's a really good point i've, I've come across this before that um when, that on the few occasions when i've actually got to talk to people who are involved in the standard setting process they, they're they're really hungry for that kind of feedback and i i think it's a shame that people often think well that's that that pro- that process is probably going to be handled by the professional body or by the big four. They're not really interested in what I have to say, and they are. They really are interested in what you they have are. to say. I can, I can tell you from being involved in sort of the 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 technical advisory group at the FRC that they are very keen to hear from smaller practitioners and companies who are dealing with it. I mean, uh, you know, the big four, the top 20 firms, all sorts of people, you know, they, they're obviously great at what they do, but a lot of the time they might not deal with micro entities and FRS 105. So the FRC are really looking for comments to be received from those that are dealing with the standard on a daily basis. And, you know, it, you might be a sole practitioner or in a two partner firm, and you might send a response in about something that you don't agree with, and there could have there could have been a flurry of the same responses, and the FRC will then do something about it, or they will try to come up with a solution. Good. Well, that I think that's a that we, I've got to 
move us on because we're going to run out of time. But actually, that's a really nice place to leave things on to encourage yeah. people that, that your voice is 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 they're interested in listening to it and people sh should become involved. Um, so I'll say thank you, Steve, for now. Um, as always, fascinating, and thank you for summarising all that so neatly. Um, stick around, come back at the end, yeah, and okay. I'm sure people will have questions. Oh, actually, I have got one question here, Steve, that someone has posted. I should have noticed it earlier. Um, it's about lease accounting. If we're capitalising the right to use an asset, should the asset be split between current and non-current, reflecting the consumption of the right to use the asset? Well, if you've got a current asset so a lease of uh an asset of a shop well short term short term asset this is so anything current is 12 months or less you could just write that off over um the lease term in much the same way that we do an operating lease now because there is going to be an exception to um on balance sheet lease accounting for short term leases which are leases that have got 12 months or less to run from the start of the lease, that is, not at the balance sheet date. So that, that's important to emphasise that. Um, anything else, um, you would be capitalising. Okay. Unless right. it's a low value asset as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. All right. Well, thank you very much. And we'll see you again uh, at the end. Yep. Great. So. Now I'm delighted to welcome Accounting CPD's Rachel Bruce, who's going to share some of the things we've learned from you this month. Rachel's our publisher. She handles all of our relationships with authors and subject matter experts. I think I've shared this in, in one webinar before. I hope it wasn't um, you, you, those of you listening today who heard this. But Rachel recently celebrated her 23rd anniversary at Nelson Crew, the publisher of Accounting <laughs> CPD. So she Thanks, really Alan. does know. Yeah, she, that's not very kind, is it? She really <laughs> does know a thing or two about how things work around here. But hello, Rachel. Hello, Alan. Thank you for uh, uh, listening to me again today. Good. Um, so um, we re I, we recently had an autumn statement in November, although I think a lot of us have now forgotten that ever happened, but we yes. did. So what's been the reaction from our users? Yeah, so uh, obviously at Accounting CPD, we were, uh, released a fair bit of content on that. Um, so the day after the statement, we actually published some content from Steve um, in his analysis using a, a news bite. Um, and so we were just thinking, what does the autumn statement mean for accountants? And it looks like, you know, we're thinking that 2024 will be a more settled year with inflation falling. Um, some big changes in national insurance with contributions falling, obviously, to 10 percent for the majority of people. Um, so generally, this statement went as expected, I think, was what everybody said. But we, we asked our learners, you know, what are the standout measures for you or your business and why? And these are some of the comments that we had. So. Um, so somebody said, not many stand up measures, to be honest, an increase in minimum wage should hopefully help for some people. So this was a really common comment and lots of people were unsurprised about this. Um, there were some other comments like, for example, the public sector were hoping for announcements on social care funding, but there was nothing that will help. Um, so I think that was relevant to a few of our users for sure. Um, and then the, the one of the general vibes is about the decrease in national insurance contributions and people saying this is the going to be the only thing that will directly impact me. So I think, you know, we did have some some comments, but there was not, as you, as, you know, as you're saying, it kind of went as as expected. I think there was a discussion that I read about how they were to some extent holding fire and waiting for the spring, um, perhaps yes. prior, to, prior to an election. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see what happens then. Um, you mentioned uh, 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 national insurance. We we published a bite on that, didn't we? What did what did that cover? Yes, yeah, so obviously there were some changes to national insurance, so we thought they merited their own bite. So we did um, publish a bite with this with one of our subject matter experts, Andy Rain, for being involved in that, and he provided a little history of the recent changes to national insurance. So he said in the bite, um, in April 2022, Class One rates went up by 1.25 percent to 13.25 percent on earnings between 9,880 and 50,270, and a 3.25 percent increase on earnings. Um, or over £50,270. Um, and it goes on to kind of make some discussions about that. So it's worth going and having a look at that and seeing, you know, and just getting, giving yourself a bit of a background about that if you need to just remind yourself of the numbers and the and the figures. Um, is that in class, in terms of class two national insurance, it's being scrapped for the self-employed, um, but that it's still possible to pay on a voluntary basis to accrue a qualifying year. So it's worth remembering that. So during this bite, which is worth going and have a look at, we asked our license holders um, who will benefit most from the national insurance changes that are announced and why. And the general consensus was, it, people were to say, it looks as though the changes will mostly benefit the employed and self-employed. And there's a small change, but every little does help. Um, so small but good. Um, 
And a couple of comments like we had this one. I think the employer's burden should have been lowered also, as a lot of small businesses businesses in, for example, hospitality, are already struggling with higher raw material costs. They will really feel the effect of um the increase on national minimum wage. As so this user would have really liked some help for smaller businesses, I think, um, particularly the ones that are needing to raise wages in line with the minimum. So so yeah, some interesting comments and feedback, and it was a very well used bite. So worth going and have a look at look at if you haven't done so already. Right. Um, so finally, um, the domestic reverse charge for VAT. I think you've been looking at that. <laughs> yes, we have. And that was also Andy Rainford again as well, who was talking about uh, the domestic reverse charge for VAT. Um, and so before we started the bite and talking about this, we asked users how much they knew about reverse charging. Um, and more than half of our users said that they'd heard of it, but weren't sure what it was for. So we thought it was worth a bit of a recap. Um, so Andy wrote about how builders no longer charge VAT on their affected invoices and instead their customer will make a reverse charge entry on their own VAT return as output tax with a corresponding input tax claim. And this, of course, only works if both parties are VAT registered. So at the end of the bite, which again, if it's relevant to you, worth going and having a look at, um, we asked, what advice would you give to construction businesses to make sure they're getting this right? And we had lots of users that come back and said that, you know, it's really worth checking the four questions to see what applies. And we talk about these in the bite. And so the four questions are, is their customer VAT registered? Um, is their customer registered for the construction industry scheme? Um, does the work in question fall within the scope of the construction industry scheme? And is the customer an end user or intermediate, uh, intermediary supplier for any of the work? Um, so a lot of users are finding this particular check checklist really, really useful. And and I think a lot of the comments are what we see time and time again on accounting CPD bytes and in our courses as well, is keep very clear records, um, communicate very clearly with your suppliers. Um, and I think obviously again, that just that 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 can be applied to all sorts of areas um that we're talking about in accounting. And obviously Julia was talking about this earlier as well, about you know, just talking to people and listening to people and how important that is in this industry. Um, yeah, so that was that bite. Keep very clear records. We were talking about that with Julia and Steve before we came live on the webinar about CPD records as well. Yes. So yeah, that goes right across. That comes across across activity. Well, yeah, thank absolutely. you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. That's brilliant. Um, uh, but stay where you are um, okay. while I welcome back Julia and Steve so that we can uh, share some of the questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to ask Steve the first question. If you were president of ICAW, what would you change? <laughs> God, I've been on I'm spot. not sure they'd let you be. You're ACCA, aren't you? So there's no way they'd let you be. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> not what I could change, could it? Because I'm not an ICAW member. <laughs> Let's ignore that for the moment. <laughs> you can become one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think um, I can really answer that, to be honest, because um, it's... It, it's not something that I've got any experience in being a president of, of anything, in fairness. <laughs> That's fine. I'm being facetious, of course. Um, Julia, um, I was talking to Steve about the the impact of, of regulation on, on smaller entities. To what extent do you think regulatory bodies get the balance right between sort of large public interest entities and smaller organisations when they're, they're thinking through policy? I, I, I don't think they get it right. You want asked to what extent i think um you know let, let's let's be mean and take the frc because they are one of the key regulators that we're concerned with from a audit and accounts point of view and you know their primary remit is if you like the capital markets so the listed companies and so there's a lot of effort a lot of concentration there they do take steps like having you know people like steve on committees and and groups that uh, advise but quite often what we hear from the SME sort of end of the market and what we see as you know, technical experts and, and lecturers looking at it is that they haven't really quite understood and they don't build things from the bottom up. So if you built an auditing standard, and this goes right internationally because it's IAASB you know, that are writing auditing standards, if you properly built them from the bottom up for a small entity, they would be properly principle based. They would work for a tiny weeny audit or a massive great audit and Th th there's not enough of an understanding of that and they're not built from the bottom up and the same applies to a lot of the accounting standards or the us to at least because it's designed more for the SME market you know does hit that sweet spot much much better I know this is a hobby horse of yours Steve that um, 
uh, simplicity in accounting standards. Maybe we'd be better off in terms of keeping the standards simple if we started by writing a standard for a smaller entity and then co uh, uh, complicating it for uh, more complex situations rather than I've been the other saying, way around. I've been saying that for years, you know, and Julia is, is completely on the same page as me with this in that, you know, you, writing standards big down rather than down up is the wrong direction and this to me is the reason why audit quality is where it is because people just don't understand what the standard is actually requiring from them rachel i have a question for you um we've been yes. reviewing the year um today if you had to pick out one thing that's created a buzz or a, a, i don't know interest or controversy or whatever it might be amongst our users what, what would it be oh that's really hard to pick one thing um i think when we're looking at our flagship courses we've published quite a few courses in the last kind of quarter of the year um and I, there's three in particular i think um we've published one on ai for for accountants and we were really interested to see what, what accountants were thinking about that and the course kind of look, helps you to kind of understand how to use ai efficiently and like look at how you're going to increase productivity and if it, as a result of it and actually everyone's been really really positive about it and I thought there would be some pushback but there really hasn't and people are saying it's a real eye-opener for what the future holds and great information and education for everybody and the content has made me think about my own skills development so lots of really interesting kind of feedback about that already um, and we also published a course called the year in accountancy as well which really kind of goes back across the whole of 2023 and reviews the key headlines and developments and the trends of the past year to really help you understand the implications for the profession so um that was just a you know something that we haven't ever done before accounting cpd but it's, it's worked really well and um, people seem to be really enjoying enjoying it and really having a look at that really good re like review of the whole year so those two things and finally i think our uh, new course on dilemmas and threats, ethical dilemmas and threats, and really looking at that and those grey areas of ethics and how to deal with them and how to approach them. So, sorry, that's not one thing, that's three, but those are my three highlights, I think, that I'd like to pick out. Good. Thank you very much. So so I, I guess with that, I should I should wrap this up or we're going to overrun our, our time out, stay our welcome. Um, don't forget, we have automatic logging. So if you're watching this live, your CPD will be logged by the system. Normally, that accounts for pretty much everybody watching because accounting CPD webinars are a service exclusive to license holders. Today, though, we have some people trying out our webinars for the first time. If you're one of those people and are interested in signing up for accounting CPD for 2024, just head over to the website to find out more or messages. Whether or not you decide to take up a license, you can record your attendance at today's webinar as an hour of verifiable CPD on the site, and it'll appear on your CPD log. Just remains for me to say thank you to our panellists. Thank you, Julia, for sharing us your observations of your year as queen of everything. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Steve, for talking us through the periodic review. Uh, and thank you, Rachel, for sharing what we've learned from the accounting CPD community this month. Most importantly, thank you all for coming. Our next Lunch and Learn webinar is at 1pm on the 24th of January, when we'll be welcoming back Steve, we'll be focusing on audit. Before that, we'll be back live this Thursday at 11 o'clock when we welcome Mo Kanjalel, who'll be talking about equality and inclusion. For those of you who, who are, won't be able to make that, I hope you're able to relax and enjoy the festive period. Everyone here at Accounting CPD wishes you a happy and a prosperous new year. Till then, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>